Okay. As Adam said, uh, my name is Jason Newman. I work for the risk management center. I've been with the risk management center since the doors opened uh, probably over 15 years ago. Hydraulic engineer by training, um, and I still sit uh, at the hydrologic engineering center where I worked before I was at the risk management center <coughs> in Davis, California. So, real quick, how many H and H people are out there? How many economists? Do we have any economists out there? All right. We think the best training is to be a consequence specialist for a risk assessment. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. If you're here, you can. I, I have it. I have these discussions all the time, arguments whether economics. Right, economics is good, understanding people, it helps give you a background on why people do what they do, understanding what properties are, that kind of stuff. H and H, hydraulics is really important, where the water is going, how quickly it gets there, how deep, uh, what the velocity is going to be really important. But for some reason, the geotechs always think they know the most about consequences, so the rest of you out there. Uh, Okay, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today is definition of all consequence management within the broader risk management framework, describing the essential elements of our consequence estimation. Uh, we're going to talk about the breach parameters and how, how they impact the flood characteristics. We're going to identify sources of uncertainty um, and then talk about building that case, right? Because we're all we're talking about, right? We have a tool, it's called LifeSim. We're really excited about it, but you can't just sit around and push the buttons on it and get a result. Being able to talk about what's going on in there, ask the right questions, and build a case for these estimates. Okay, so here's our essential element. If you don't take anything else away from this, please try to fix this first part. Speaking of that, I know it's getting late. How many of you are west or mountain time? West coast mountain time? Um, so I figured you, you're the biggest side, west coast, just like me, the biggest side. Except for Nimish and Jenny and I, who are on the flight that arrived at 2 a.m. in the morning. Anybody else on that one? Okay. Nimish and Jenny, if you guys fall asleep, that's all right. Rest you, not so much. Okay, first one, how many people are exposed to the flooding? So when we talk about that, at the onset of the event, you're about to have a big flood event. Where are people located before that event starts? And then how do people redistribute due to any warning evacuation that they make it? Talk a lot about consequences. The focus of this is really going to be estimating potential loss of life. So we're going to be talking a lot about people and the potential for them to lose their life because of a flood event. Really, a lot of our decisions are focused on um, that concept of life safety is paramount. So that's what the focus is going to be. So how scary is the flood? That's what we talked about. Have an idea where people might be. Now let's talk about what the depths and velocities and the arrival times are going to be. Next piece that um, is often not talked about enough is okay, people are still there. We have this feel for what the depths of losses are going to be. Are they going to be in a, a mobile home? Are they going to be in a five story concrete structure? Right? Their potential for surviving that flood is quite a bit different. So you got to be able to talk about that and the built infrastructure that's out there. Um, and then you wrap all that together. Are the people that are exposed to that in those conditions? How likely is it that they're going to die? Just because somebody is in a structure that gets washed downstream doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lose their lives. Just like somebody who's walking through two feet of water doesn't necessarily mean they're going to survive. So what can we, what do we know about historic examples of this that help us understand the likelihood of people dying in this situation? And then another one that we'll talk some about is the potential for indirect life loss. So there's direct life loss where people come in contact with the flood, and then there's indirect life loss because you have a large regional event, it upsets the infrastructure there, it puts people that are already in a mobile situation in even a worse situation. And we've seen historically that indirect life loss can be uh, very significant, especially for those larger events. So we'll talk about that. And in every one of these, we need to think about this concept of scalability. We don't need to go out there and run live stream at the most detailed level for every single estimate we're doing, right? 
For certain questions, we can do something relatively straightforward. So just get a feel for it. Is it going to be a high amount of life loss? Do we need, where do we need to sharpen our pencil? One. And so what we're going to do, what I'm going to try to talk to you about this afternoon is the basic concepts for how we go through a life loss estimate. And then tomorrow morning, first thing, we're going to do what I would consider that roughest level quick estimate as part of the exercise. Walk through each one of these in a rough way to get an idea of what that life loss might be. Okay, so what we're going to do um, for each one of these concepts, we're going to walk through a historic example to tell uh, the jam firm. So I'm going to walk through some, some eyewitness accounts to kind of reinforce each one of these essential elements. I don't want to make you listen to me the whole time, so I'm going to let you read some here. So, so let's start with this and then we'll talk. Okay, give me some thoughts on what matters about when you're thinking about potential for loss of life. What from this couple sentences should you be thinking about makes a difference? Awake, oh, that's great. One. First time one morning, probably not going to work. Sunny day, good. One of the ways to warn people, reverse 911, might not work because they're outside. Sorry, so they survived. <laughs> <laughs> Took all the excitement out of the cold. Okay, so outside, good. Daytime. So another thing is sunny, right? Got environmental cues. Uh, there's not a big rainstorm going on. What do you mean there's sunny, right? There's another thing to think about. Something else um, that we'll, we'll talk about. So now let's talk about the one. What do we know about this one? What do you think? Do you think this was an effective warning, ineffective? Tell me why. Okay. So that's a good concept. That initial idea of building trust with somebody is left out here. Right? This could have been some random crazy guy. Just kind of seems to be that every warning system and the founding of the U.S. is following the writing of the British technology. Yeah. And there are case history that they have in Massachusetts where it's just someone yeah. lands a capital. Everybody goes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you stop that, you're still driving the road. Right. right. That's fine. So, we've done a lot of research on the warnings and I'll talk a little bit about this on what makes an effective warning. The messaging is important. When I talked with our experts on this, the social sciences, they say this is a, honestly about as good as it gets when they talk about just a live person. They're telling you what has happened. They're telling you what uh, the impact is going to be. They're telling you what to do about it. But what they may not say. So what could have made this better? Back to that trust thing. That person has shown up just as one better than that. And it's not that many problems. Like requirement. Right. The fireman shows up, right? You got that trust and you say this, bam, that is as good a warning as you're going to get to get people moving in a really quick way. Okay. Oh, what would you do? Oh, sorry. Um, the public perception um, percentage of the population that doesn't trust policemen nearly as much as firemen. Firefighters have calendars, is what she said. If you make any okay, so I've talked about about this talk, this is like some my big thinking through. So, what do I do? What would you do if somebody came to your door, told you that, gave you a really good warning, like this person was you? What would you do? 
Google it. Okay, so you can confirm what you just heard. Anybody else? You just been around the door? Okay. Anybody else? Animals? I think it will depend on the situation, too. I mean, beekeeper in the middle of a big city. The chances are they're not knocking on everybody's door. If they're more isolated, where you're five miles from the nearest neighbor, if someone's there, they're there for a reason. Yeah. And so you're going to be more likely to get some people they got. Or urban rural situation is going to be yeah. going to be different. Got to figure out how to protect all my marijuana plants in the basement. So let's see what this. So they put some of their important stuff upstairs, but we uh, collected what obviously was not the certificate, otherwise, you would have left them there. Um, and then got that was important. We brought that family photo for the response to the That's some of the irreplaceable stuff that they would take with them. They didn't just run out the door, they got a couple things and then left. Just cleaning up. Okay, the important thing to understand about warnings is you're going to get that initial warning, whether it was from your, uh, an individual person or through whatever primary warning system is that, that's used to contact you. But there's always other war ways that warnings come through, so the, the, what we would call those secondary warnings. What we found during the Oroville Dam evacuation, we did a, did a big study after that, sent out a survey about how people received warnings. About a third of them got their primary warning by from one of their friends and family calling. So that's a very efficient way, an effective way to get warnings out is when a loved one calls you, um, and that's an important thing to understand. Also, the idea of uh, how people connect with the world is a important to understand, right? This shows you landlines versus wireless only versus a combination of the two. Uh, we'll come back to a question on this a little bit later. Yeah. 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 Just the first understanding of. First understanding of whether there's a risk of whether you live behind a levee or you live downstream of the dam. Right. Well, this is that public education. Next piece. So the evacuation component, right? People, we've got people moving out of their house. So now let's talk through what that evacuation looks like. Question one that I always have in mind um, is we have two cars. I have two kids and my wife. I think we would separate it. Send my wife and one kid in one and me and the other and go and hopefully see each other again. We all stay in one car as we leave the four behind. We take the four wheel drive and we go. Um, but they obviously, Wanted to get all as much stuff out as they could. So that's not one thing. Um, the other one is we have some sophisticated evacuation modeling, traffic simulation 
if you're really doing a detailed study. That's great. You're never going to be able to model something like this. Human decision making where they get halfway out and decide, you know what, I want to go back and get my heart more or so, um, No matter what you see from tools like LifeSim or anything else like that, remember that it's always a model that is useful, not the answers. Be willing to ask those questions of it. Um, and then understanding your evacuation, whether it's something like this, trying to evacuate Houston during the before a hurricane, right? Um, or whether your evacuation planning may not be as good as it should be, right? You can get some confusing information, right? So you need to think through the evacuation, even if you're not running an evacuation model, think through what the potential is for people to be able to get out before the water shows up. How long are going to be out? Okay, more well, peace. The war made it out safely. Now this last piece is that the shelter provided by the fire administration. So if they hadn't left real quick, the chances of them surviving is going to be pretty low because a lot of the structures got washed away. Um, but you need to be able to think about the types of structures that are there and the depth and velocity. And are you going to have a situation like we saw in Katrina, where the velocity was relatively low, but you had that bunch of depth out there for a long time. But people with ability to survive in New Orleans, this type of flooding, is quite a bit different than what we saw on the Mississippi coast for that same event. Where the surge and waves just completely wiped out those structures. Right? So being able to talk about that difference, understand the likelihood of survival is quite a bit different if you're stuck in one of those areas. Okay, <clears throat> this one's on some of the fatality rates. So the idea, like I was just saying, you're caught out washed away, and if you're caught in the open, washed away, the likelihood of survival is quite different. So we're going to go through one specific example. Another thing about warning, right? Somebody trying to warn somebody on the ground using an airplane. Yeah, you can cover a lot of ground, but it's hard to get an actual message to them. All right, so you get caught in this Just thinking about the debris and all the other stuff that's going on in there. Really, your likelihood of survival comes down to luck. In this case, one of them survives, the other one didn't make the case in the, the same situation. Okay. So when we talk about fatality rates and the likelihood of surviving for this one specific incident, that is a 50% chance of surviving in those conditions. Okay, last piece here is the impact black box of the Teton. How many people died during the Teton flood event? It's not way off, but it's a little, a little bit less. Okay, how many of you have used the reclamation consequence estimation method, arson? There's a couple of you. A little bit lower. So the official number, and if you look at the arson method, this is what they use. The official number is 11. For the um, but then let's talk about the breakdown between direct and indirect. So here's the uh, list of people who died. And, and, right? The colors are to see. 
So the blue is the, the top. It's a weapon. Who who called it? Who who knows the goal? Okay. I'll figure out where we miss. We're missing one. Um. Oh. So the direct are those that came in contact with the water um, that got washed away and drowned. But now let's talk about the indirect here. Um, oh, yeah, maybe it's supposed to be a little bit. Something got messed up here in this slide. Sorry about that. So we had a, we well, see some of the older ones um, died in the hospital after being evacuated, had a heart attack. There was one, um, I don't a heart attack, accidental gunshot wound sustained while removing the gun from the vehicle. Oh, I think somebody moved forward. And if you look at James B, it says with Glenby, so there's two of them that one. Um, this is James, uh, and this is Glenn. Oh, okay. um, so one was removed that's the side, um, that I caught. So there was another one after this that was a suicide that was also attributed to uh, the gunshot wounds. So it's caused by that. Okay, so those are the things to, to think about. Indirect versus direct. And being able to talk about it is the first thing and how it, it might really matter. Um, and we'll have a little bit longer. Okay, let's talk through each one of these now. How do we how do we come up with estimates for this? What kind of information do we need? First one, um, what we like to start with is a structure inventory. And what does that structure inventory need to look like? Um, the idea is really we just need to have a feeling for where people are, and we put them in a structure inventory because the kind of structure that they might be trapped in matters to us as part of this estimate. So we got a structure inventory with people in it. We're good to go. Um, so location of those structures or your, your maximum extent. Um, the level of detail in those structures can vary quite a bit, your structure placement. Uh, number of stories matter because we start talking about how tall the structures are, if people can stay above the water. Uh, foundation height for the same reason, occupancy type helps us understand if it's a, if it's a commercial structure versus maybe a residential structure, how people would evacuate those types of structures, how people would um, get warned in those types of structures are different. Construction types, like I talked about, wood structure versus concrete can matter. Uh, population is a big one. Um, same thing about <clears throat> the redistribution is the next one here through evacuation. So this is how we like to break down the evacuation timelines. Like I said, we thought we, I was lucky enough to, get, to engage with two of the, probably the, the most recognized social science, quantitative social science uh, experts in the world when it came to understanding why people do what they do during a flood event. Dr. John uh, Sorensen and Dennis Valetti. Uh, I've been called out after every major disaster in the U.S. to do a forensic analysis of, of what went on. They came and, and did me a favor to help us get this information built into how we do things because they thought it was so important and they wanted the federal agencies to really start to think about this and build it into how we do things. Not just so we can get a better estimate on, hey, here's what we think the life loss is going to be, but so we can start coming up with a better understanding and coming up with ways to reduce it and get that education out there for other people to use. So this is the, the timeline that they, they came up with for us, um, starting with when the threat is detected. Then you have this, what we call the warning delay time. We know there's a threat. We contacted the emergency management agency to say, hey, there's a threat here. Now they have certain procedures they have to go through before they will flip the switch on whatever warning systems they may have in place. Often in the US, most emergency management is organized on a county level. So if we're interacting with the emergency managers, we'll call the, the local sheriff, because that was the primary actor when it came to Orville, and start having those conversations. But there's a delay there between when they know something's going on and when they flip the switch. Once they flip the switch on whatever warning systems they have in place, it takes time for that warning to spread through the population. Right? You don't just turn on reverse 911 and then the next second everybody has it. It takes time. 
So you have to get in the body in different ways to get that message. Then once you receive that message, the last piece is kind of what we saw in this uh, repeat pattern example here is different people take different amounts of time to to respond, to take the recommended protective action. So how long is that delay between when people hear about it and when they respond? Obviously, the goal here is to shorten this as much as possible. So the quicker you can move through each of the steps, quicker people are moving after this. So I'm going to touch on each one of these real quick and kind of on the factors that matter when it comes to reducing this delay time. Starting with one delay time. <clears throat> Any thoughts on what matters when it comes for emergency management agencies between when they know there's a problem and when they actually flip the switch on the warning warning system? When? Very good. What about verification? Verification is important. That's not so. What you'll see, and I'll show you the guidebook that we have. They they list a whole bunch of factors that matter, and they got the primary one, secondary, and tertiary, and they all matter. But if you, I'm just going to touch on one thing. It's shown to matter the most, but that is the verification. So planning is good. What always comes along with planning that's really helpful? Planning and you're practicing. You have a plan, you're more likely to be able to do it. And then there's one other thing that <clears throat> so sorry, warning plan and operating procedures are written down. Warning thresholds are in place. Um, warning thresholds. So if you thought about it ahead of time, if you thought about here's the types of issues we might see at this point. Signs of distress. And once you've done that, you've thought through what that means in terms of a potential flood threat. And importantly, if you've already thought through what you're going to be telling the public in that situation, then you have really done a lot to reduce that one time. What we saw in the Orville flood event, um, they got that understanding in the in the room that they were going to have. An evacuation. They needed to issue an evacuation. And then it took them about 30 minutes, which wasn't a long time, but it took them about 30 minutes from in the room when they knew there was going to be an evacuation to when they got that first evacuation order out. They were doing two things. One was trying to figure out who to warn. But they didn't have maps that were specific to what they were trying to do. So trying to figure out who to warn. And the second one was trying to figure out what to we can come up with these templates ahead of time and say, here's what we're going to say for these different situations as a really good step in the approach. So this is practice, right? You have the plan, SOP, you're, you're practicing it. Uh, and then the responsibilities are clearly defined. Everybody knows when it comes time to issue a warning, this is the person that's going to do it. And there's backup plans for that if that person's not around. Okay, warning diffusion time. First thing we've done is switch and put flint on whatever warning systems they have available. <clears throat> what really matters in terms of how quickly that warning spreads? Time of night. Time of day is good. We're going to get to that a little bit more. Anybody up? That's the warning system. Good. All right, thank you. So type of warning, and it, it comes down to really a nor uh, the, the number and mix of warning systems you have in place. Why does this matter? Communities out there are, are diverse, right? Diverse in terms of age, education, race. And because of that, how they interact with the world is different. The way I interact with the world is a lot different than my 14-year-old, right? So don't just rely on that silver bullet, that reverse 911. That'll get a piece of them. But if you say, I'm going to embrace it all, new technology, old technology, that's how you're going to get the warning spread the quickest. Yeah, definitely. Okay, frequency and distribution. This just means there, there has been this concept of I'm not going to issue another warning unless something changes. That's not good. Mm -hmm. Keep getting that warning out. The more times you get people, the more likely it is to, to get it. And then this last 
and I don't even wish I had about this time in the afternoon during this talk, right? The ability to wake people. So I'm going to tell you something I haven't done before. Everybody stand up. Okay. Now, if you still have a landline in your house today, really just a way to let me let the old guys sit down. <laughs> So, um, the next one is if you silence your phone at night before you go to bed, stay safe. You, you stay standing because you silence your phone. Okay. Now, the last one is if you have turned off the wireless emergency alerts on your phone. Stay safe. If you know if you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably know. There's a pattern. So there's no way to get that guy awake in the middle of the night. What you say? Oh. All right, so those are the ways it used to be. 20 years ago, almost everybody had a landline. Nobody turned those off. You could call them and you're going to wake them up in the middle of the night. They might not like it, but that's how you wake them up. These days, it, it's a lot harder. People are just turning off their cell phones. They don't have landlines. So we're relying on this wireless emergency alert that's on everybody's phone um, that you can turn off all of the alerts on there. There's the Amber Alert, you've probably seen. And then there's a couple other levels of emergency alert, and then there's the presidential alert. That's the only one you cannot turn off. But those other ones, um, a lot of people were turning off up until 2019. In 2019, the geolocating got a lot better, so you weren't getting warnings about a tornado that was 100 miles away or a hurricane that was too far away. So if you have turned yours off in the past, maybe rethink that and turn it back on um, because. That's how we wake people up, at least currently. That's another way. How many of you have a weather radio? Also a good idea, and I know some parts of the country, those are a lot more popular than others, but there's a whole bunch of different ways to, to spread that warning. Um, but the one in your pocket is usually the most effective. County will call the landlines and send out the text message and call cell phone. That's true, but usually you have to sign up for the wireless part. You're automatically signed into the landline, but the rest of it is off. They call my wireless phone, my wife's wireless phone, our landline phone, and they send us both text messages. That's pretty good. And you didn't have to opt into any of that. There you go. So the new technology that just comes up, right? Yeah, that's why the geolocating matters so much on the on the cell phone because it's all based on where you're located. It doesn't matter where your phone number was or where you were yesterday. It's all about where you're As all of our uh, houses become more interconnected to the internet, uh, they'll be able to flip on your lights in the middle of the night to wake you up. So that would be great. Look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, okay. The, the new security system, same thing. Uh, okay. And yeah, I said that embracing modern technology. Use them all, but embrace it. There's a whole bunch of new stuff. And it's getting better and better on the phones. Embrace it. Okay, last thing, defensive action initiation. What can we do to make to motivate people to get out of the way as quick as possible? Education is a key thing here. So what we found, what we learned through our engagement with our experts in the social sciences, um, is really it all comes down to your message, content, and stuff. So education of the public is important to try to do it. Why is it not nearly as effective as making sure you have the right message when it matters? If you're doing public education campaigns, you do not have the public 
involved, right? You can talk about it. You're trying to get a message to them where there's, well, you have their attention, but you lose it real quick. In the middle of an emergency, you have their attention. So when you have their attention, make sure you get all the right information in front of them so they're not off Googling it, trying to verify it with somebody else, and maybe getting this information. Get it all in front of them. So what's that message content? What's that look like? This, this is really what matters. Um, source, right? So that thing. Who's it coming from? If you have a local source, local weather, local news, that's always better than national. But if you can put, hey, we're all aligned. Store, FEMA, local weather, those, we're all aligning this. That's how you get that, that trust there broken down the quickest. Describe the stunning event and its impacts, um, the location. So uh, the important part of this is specificity. Say the impact area values and where they can be easily understood, um, street names, but, but be specific. Uh, tell people what protective action to take, when to do it, and how to accomplish it. Being very specific. Right. So another thing we learned from the Oracle. Um, Evacuation was the message that went out is low lying areas downstream of Oroville evacuate. All right, that, that could be a wide range of a lot of confusion about who does not. So be a lot more specific. People between these two streets move to the west. These people move to the east. Be specific, be specific about when to do it. Um, and then talk about when this message is provided. So people come across it, they understand that this still matters. You can get all that out there. You've done everything you can to motivate protective action as quick as possible. So the Dr. Malay and Sorensen put together a guidance document for us. Hopefully this is the next. Oh. Uh, um, okay, I'll talk about that. So how we use this um, is they identify each of the factors that really matter for us, but the quantitative social sciences. So they put together some relationships that showed, based on their understanding of past events, about how long it's going to take for each of these delays to actually exist. So for a well-prepared emergency management agency that understands to get their planning out there and their practices and do all those things we talked about, most likely the, uh, the amount of time it's going to take, that delay is going to be really short. We have seen you put them really well prepared that make that delay can go a lot longer, but most likely that delay is going to be quite short, around 15 minute time frame. For those that are less prepared, um, it's going to be a lot longer. So what does this mean? This is how we use this kind of information to start building that timeline in a quantitative perspective. But what else do we know here? There's a lot of uncertainty. Back to what Adam was talking about, you have to be able to talk about uncertainty. Just because they're well prepared doesn't mean everything's going to go well. So start understanding this range of uncertainty. Similarly, for how quickly a warning spread, they gave us this idea of okay, about the slowest that we could expect is this amount of time, this percentage of the population that has received the warning, and then about as quickly as you can expect to show here on this curve, right? So there's a wide range of uncertainty there. 60 minutes in, it could be at a warning of just under 20 percent, or you could be up to 100 percent. Depending on what type of warning system it is. A lot of uncertainty. And then the process we have helps us narrow down this uncertainty, but this is the, the range that we're starting with. And then the last piece is how long people will take to respond. And again, coming down a lot of based on the message. Wide range of uncertainty. So, how do you reduce that uncertainty? Um, what they developed for us is a way to go out and talk to emergency managers. Using what we call an elicitation, we ask them about 60 questions that really get to the heart of each of those important factors that matter, that they've identified that matter, and we explore it. Um, so we use whatever development to, to kind of narrow it down, but we really want to get out there and reduce that uncertainty. We'll, we'll go out and do a formal elicitation. Ask those questions. You're still going to have uncertainty in all those ranges, but the uncertainty is going to be quite a bit lower. And it allows you to build the case for why you think you're going to get a really good response, or maybe one that's not so good. Here's that, that um, document I was talking about. You can Google this guide to public alerts and warnings to download the emergencies. It's out there all over the internet. 
Um, and it's a really good document for emergency managers to take all of that science, all that research based knowledge, and boils it down into some specific items that, that they can use. <laughs> it also has a bunch of templates in the map that says if you're using this type of messaging system, that is confined to this many characters. This is how the message should go out. Here's where you put those components in that map. So if you haven't seen this, I would recommend you looking at that. Okay. We have some detailed evacuation modeling that can be done. Again, back to what I was talking about for evacuation. This is one of the things you can't really do by hand. A lot of this other stuff you can. Um, if you want to jump into a tool like last year, they have the Department of Transportation evacuation modeling scheme built in there. Um, where it takes into consideration the, the density of population, the more cars on the road, the slower it's going to go. Um, but it, it, it's really sophisticated. This is what it looks like where you see people getting warned and yelling and the blue is moving, the, the cars moving, the model is moving out over the road network, uh, traffic congestion, intersection, a lot of fun stuff. You know, all sorts of fun things. And then it, it models the, the water coming through. So you put a flooding in there, it comes through, it closes down the road, people lose their homes, all of that. And, and the power of something like this is if you have a flood event, you can start talking with emergency managers about, hey, we need to talk about this intersection here or where, the, where we might need to do the road flows first. You have a bunch of people evacuating that way, they're going to get stuck and there's going to be a problem. So let's talk about your evacuation plan and take this into consideration. There's also some other things to take into consideration. Most people that die during a flood event die why? Driving through why? Right? So we're going to come up with some method that talks about how people die. So probably take into consideration people making relatively questionable choices about trying to drive through water that they see. So we have research that shows here's the likelihood of people driving through water based on the depths. People have set up cameras at intersections. There's all sorts of ways that they've done this. This is what we would build in as our sophisticated model on the likelihood of people coming through and accounting for the potential for people to die through that model. We also have vertical evacuation, and this really just comes down to um, how tall your structure is, whether it has an edge, and then it are the people that are in that structure, uh, do they have limited mobility, right? If they don't have limited mobility, they're more likely to be able to get into the attic or on the roof. If they have limited mobility, they're just going to be able to get to the top floor. So that's the understanding of how we deal with vertical evacuation for people that are, that are trapped in the structure. That detail. Severe, so flood severity. Um, this all comes down to depth, velocity, arrival time, and extent. Now, what matters when getting to that? Um, so, the scenarios. We talked about it during breach. You, you guys have talked through this today, right? The different scenarios. What's the, the stage elevation? Um, or is it in the river? Is it a breach or non breach? And then it, it can be very failure mode specific. What's the failure mode that's leading to this? That's going to impact the breach parameters. That could have a big influence on, on what the hydrograph looks like, like down to uh, terrain one, one dimensional versus two dimensional. Uh, initial conditions and incremental coincident flows can have a huge impact on your time. For example, back to the Oroville example, for this scenario, this is Oroville up here, this is Marysville, and then Sacramento is down here. Um, if we assumed that there was a large flood event going on and you were getting um, significant releases from Folsom down here, so you had your initial conditions, you had some water in there and some significant coincident inflows coming out of here. Then this, this breach scenario led to overtopping of those levees and inundating another million people. Where if you didn't assume that, if you assume just an average daily flow down there, then the water was contained in the levee and those people didn't. Eat. As you can imagine, that's a huge impact on the overall consequence. Right? So there's, you need to think through that, what's going on in the rest of the system, and, and how that can impact the consequence location. A little more on breach parameters. They can impact all the things we're looking at here. So <laughs> what we talked about is doing sensitivity analysis. Don't just dive into the most detailed breach parameter analysis using BL breach or, or wind dam or something like that. Start with sensitivity. 
come up with a hey, we think worst case is gonna look the breach is gonna look like this, best case might look like this, and then run those through in three different manners on your consequences downstream. Uh, and you, you'll see something like this often where right downstream of your dam, you can see a, a significant impact on what that hydrograph looks like downstream. But as you go further downstream, that hydrograph attenuates. So if your main consequence um, location for this scenario is well downstream, then you probably don't need to spend a lot of time refining your bridge dam because it's not going to make that big. Do that sensitivity analysis. And then decide if you need to jump into the, the more detailed one. Now, what I would like to do when I'm talking about to any team, if you're in a potential play loads analysis or in a risk assessment and you're trying to align your consequences with a failure mode, what you need to do is put a hydrograph up on the screen that talks about here's your breach hydrograph and then just start moving it. So everybody's on the same page in terms of what's going on from a warning and evacuation perspective and what's going on from a flood perspective. So here's the hydrograph, breach hydrograph. You have your failure mode initiation, which could have been days, weeks, months, years out in the, in the past. Um, <clears throat> but at some point it's gonna progress far enough that you can start to see an uptick on the, the flow through that breach. You got a pipe that forms between the, the lake and the, and the exit. And it's going to continue until you get collapse of embankment, and then you really have a large uptick in your hydrograph. From, an, uh, from a hydraulic modeling perspective, if you're talking about a tool like HEC RAS, when you're, when you're feeding a breach model there, that's what Dave talked about as, as kind of that breach initiation. That's what we put into your hydraulic model. So it's, how do we align that with the rest of the timeline of that warning and evacuation we're going to talk about? Um, here's what a breach initiation looks like for the failure mode. Um, and then you get to the full breach. So the breach initiation time is from this location from the, when the failure mode initiates. We don't talk about that often um, because that's really how it identifies. But the breach formation time is the one we talked about. This is where you get your empirical model, your McDonald, your Bond, Bontoon, and Gillette. That's what you're talking about when you look at those empirical models. Okay, so now let's talk about what's going on in terms of the observed pattern. Maybe at some <clears throat> this is going on, we, we start to observe um, some money flow that we didn't expect. So now people are getting concerned. You know what happens after people get concerned? Right? They progress this far enough so that people have enough evidence out there that they're worried the dam's going to fail. So the next step after it's on the ground, we decide the dam might fail. Well, what you've been doing is trying to intervene. That's one of the things that happened, and you decide it's not going to be successful. Uh, and then it all comes down to when that warning is issued. Uh, and that could range a lot, right? So what you do is figure out when the dam is going to fail. <clears throat> talk about that. Talk about what the delay between the, when the dam is going to fail and the warning issuance is. And then this is what matters about the, the linking your or consequential understanding when the warning goes out versus when the breach occurs. So this is when the breach occurs here. This is when the warning goes out. Tomorrow morning during the uh, exercise we do, this is going to be one of the biggest tricks is trying to figure out, all right, when does warning go out relative to that breach occur? Because it's the most common thing for the a free warning if the weather service will have a lot of no warning. So the core doesn't do warnings. The, the weather service does, but we coordinate with the emergency managers. Um, so the emergency managers downstream are, are the ones responsible for warning. We'll do the communication with the emergency and with the weather service and those emergency managers. They may be recommend some stuff, but they're the ones that do the official work. Okay, so this is that offset. Um, so again, you put this up there on the screen and talk about, okay, here's all the stuff we have going on now. What what does this offset look like? How far in advance? Or this could be after. Right? This could this reach could be or the, the warning can go out after the breach occurs, depending on how many eyes are on the dam and what kind of failure mode it is. So that's a conversation you need to have to identify that. Thing. 
we do those uh, different options for some of reach parameters and then out the empirical ones that many of you are familiar with. Um, there's also some simplified physical breaching. We use this a lot for levees where we don't have that data, where there's a, an HTC RAS that's built in where you can just do a relationship of velocity uh, versus erosion, which is one that depends on the type of um, materials and the mechanism built out of the territory. It's a really good way to get the analysis really full. <clears throat> And then you can do some detailed assessment by like CL reach or like this. Okay, what do we know about people and being able to withstand flooding in a structure? Um, it all comes down to trying to classify them into these two hazard zones. Low hazard zones are exposed to water, um, but their stability or, or the stability criteria of their shelter is not at risk. So we see this all the time people wading through flood waters. Majority of the time they're safe. So we're calling this a low hazard zone. The other one is a high hazard where people are washed away or their structure is washed away. Um, that obviously is something like that. So the whole goal here is to characterize people as either in, okay, they're still there, they're in the low hazard zone, or they're in the high hazard zone. So we have all the stability criteria for all the different types of structures and for people and for vehicles that show, all right, given this depth velocity combination, if you're above this line, you're in the high hazard zone. Below this line, there's a low hazard zone. This is for high clearance vehicles. You don't have to run down these up, right? A high clearance vehicle, people air up the tires different, they're carrying different amounts of stuff. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So recognize that you're doing a detailed assessment in a tool like LifeSim that does Monte Carlo and samples a different relationship every time, and you start to build in that answer. And then the last one is the fatality rate. So what we have in our database of fatality rates is, is what you see here. Every one of these dots on here represents a historic example that we have information on, on how many, what the flood scenario was, so for high hazard and low hazard, and how many people died in that situation. We can put together these as seasonal probability type functions that we can then use uh, to come up with those estimates. So zooming in on the low hazard, it's mostly zeros, um, but what we see here um, is an example like this, where Andrew stepped on electric wires, walking through a flooded neighborhood, and told his friend to stay away. That's how you come up with a 50% fatality rate for a low hazard situation. There's another one, people walking through that same situation, low hazard, somebody falls off into a ditch and drowns, which is always like from it. For high hazard, um, some examples of that, uh, you may remember this truck driving through, got washed away, uh, nine or 12 soldiers died jumping in the truck. Um, this one back in 1900, there was during the Galveston hurricane, is where the orphanage was washed away. Um, the nuns tried to decide to get a bunch of kids to keep them all together, keep them safe, keep track of them. Uh, all the ones that were tied together ended up dying and drowning. A couple that weren't tied together survived. So that's how we come up with the fatality rate uh, of what these people are. So, what we've done is collected a historic example to come up with these situations. And what you're doing is applying the matter of group level, right? All these people are together. What we understand about their potential to be being able to survive. So whether they're all a family stuck in a house or whether a family uh, evacuating or a large group of people, that's how we start to understand the fatality rates and apply them to the modeling procedure. Also, high hazard, what we've seen is there's many cases where people get completely washed away and everybody survives. This is a family of four, Tom Fox down right here, middle of the night, we all got washed away, they all survived. Indirect life loss, okay, almost in here. So indirect life loss, a couple concepts. I know we talked about direct versus indirect, uh, but indirect is from stress-induced medical conditions, um, power-related fatality. But really what matters for indirect life loss, what we've seen historically is it can make a big difference, but this, it comes down to this power availability really is that you lose power, and it's cold outside, what happens? 
freeze hypothermia, freeze or people bring generators into their house and take them down the floor and then carbon monoxide is going to poison them. That happens all the time. Same thing, it's really hot. You have similar issues there. Power also accidentally. Power is out, middle of the night, walking down the stairs, fall down, somebody will have it. Power is out, people are trying to repair the power network the next day. Um, a lot of electrocution is going on because of that. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why power availability is key. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we start to talk about when we talk about, hey, we're going to have a large flood event. Is it going to wipe out a bunch of power stations and impact a whole bunch of population? I can make a difference. We break it down during the flood. Um, you know, there's direct drowning, collapse of structure. You also have your accidents and medical issues that happen then. It also happens a lot getting ready for the flood event. If people know there's a flood event coming, they'll be going out there doing the construction, trying to prepare. We've seen people lose their lives just during that process. Um, the short term is the exposure, medical stress that we, we saw what that looked like. Then there's this whole long term where there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's going on. Famine, disease, more stress, medical. I mean, we could talk about political unrest in certain areas if we're talking about, especially other countries and being in some of the system. Um, <clears throat> we have a metric that we're about to publish on how to start talking about indirect life loss and coming up with really rough estimates for how big it might be. Um, but that method doesn't include these really long term impacts of it. Political unrest. But an example of what this might look like was Banqiao Dam in the 70s in China. 26,000 people died from direct, um, but another over 200,000 people lost their lives due to really small family injuries. So it would be really significant, it be way more significant than the direct life. Okay. So obviously our approach is awesome. We do all sorts of great stuff, but I'll point out a couple weaknesses before we go. Um, <clears throat> it's a model. We already talked about this with the model. Um, but we don't have uh, this prolonged exposure. Um, we don't account for that in our modeling process. So what we saw in, like in Katrina, a lot of people were, were stuck out either in their attic for a long time or out on an island for a long time that ended up losing their lives because of over um, <clears throat> we don't really account for that. And we also don't account for rest. And we've seen historically where there's been a major flood event where we'd expect a lot of people to die. But we, and we saw one in Japan, just a lot of failure, where the evacuation, the number of helicopters that showed up and pulled people out of dangerous situation was just very impressive and definitely saved some lives. We don't account for that in, in our typical modeling process. We don't have any spatial correlation of warning, which is a weakness, right? We just kind of randomly spread the warning through a community, um, rather than neighborhood neighbors warning neighbors. We don't have those things. We don't have directly built into a, our life sim approach. The indirect life loss. We're coming out with a separate one for that. So if you're interested in um, this contact me, we'll share that with you. We don't have explicit consideration of water temperature or debris. It's built into those fatality rates. We've seen this is the, the likelihood of people to die during these types of situations in the past, so it's built in there. But if you're talking about a situation that you know is going to be really cold with lots of debris, then you might want to modify your, your fatality rates slightly just to break out. And then hydraulic uncertainty is not integrated um, into our approach. This one I can't stress enough. We have in less than a Monte Carlo approach that samples all the stuff that I just talked about, uncertainty on all of that. But what you do is just give it one flood event. So if you want to talk about uncertainty in reach parameters or in value or coincident flows downstream, you got to put together separate models for that and then and bring those in separately and, and do some manual assessment there. It doesn't get done for you. Okay, <laughs> real quick. Um, the reclamation approach is, is used by some, some are, are familiar with it. It's been used by many. Um, and these three documents describe that approach. Um, and the ones I would really like to point out here are the, uh, <clears throat> this case history compilation is great. Um, so regardless of whether you use that method or not, 
that case history is a good thing to go through. Everybody should look at case histories. If you want to be a consequence specialist, look at the case histories out there on it. Um, I really I, I recommend everybody looking at that at a minimum. Why don't we use that? Why don't why does not why does the core not use the reclamation approach? When we step back and said we want to do risk management where life safety is paramount, we looked at the methods that were out there, the reclamation methods is there. Um, it's an empirical approach based on historic life loss statistics. Dude, historic damp emissions. The core inventory is a bunch of large dams, flood control dams, a bunch of above large population areas. Luckily, the historic record does not contain very many of those, especially in the US, and especially anything recent. Um, so if you want to be able to talk about empirical weaknesses of, of empirical approaches, right? If, if the empirical approach doesn't contain the type of information you're trying to make estimates on, that data set doesn't encompass what you're looking at, it's not going to be very good. We start talking about the, how warnings have changed since the early 1900s, right? All of this makes a big difference. The core, we really wanted to be able to talk about not just what life loss estimates are, but how to reduce life loss and be able to, to turn all those different knobs. Once you really understand it, we don't feel like the reclamation approach really gives us that thing. And we're worried more than just dams. We're looking at levees, failures, and just flood attention for all that sort of thing. And that's it. Appreciate everybody's input and hanging with me. I know it was a late afternoon. Um, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to, to field those. You guys asked a lot during the uh, during the actual presentation, so I'm not going to feel bad if you don't have one. Um, that's a good question. It's actually being done right now. We've almost completed it. So we, we've done a whole bunch of validation studies where we go through historic events and see what license does versus what actually happened. There is a USSD report from a couple of years ago where we published the results of that. Um, but we continue to add to that. We're doing Teton and Johnstown Dam failures this, this year. We're adding Brumadinho, the Taylor Dam failure next year. So we're going to continue doing that to get comfortable, be able to show people that should be comfortable with what we're doing. But we also learn a lot in terms of setting up. Yeah, I think um, one slide uh, 33 or 34, you were showing that the Warning only came after uh, where we were intervening to save a facility. Why is there, are, are those like mutually exclusive or, or why would we? So, this is just an example okay. um, that when that warning issued, it was out to be anywhere on the earth. So, this is just an example of what you need to do is put your hydrograph up there and start talking about the decisions that would be going on. On the ground, when people would have certain information, um, but it could it could be anywhere. Yeah. Four more questions for Jason. All right, thank you. There's a copy of the. Applauding that it's over. Perhaps, but we won't be doing that. Well, we tomorrow you're giving a presentation in the morning for a free study. Uh, you, your email got the uh, survey about how today went. Please fill it out. It's short, but if you have suggestions about what we can do better tomorrow, we will read them. And uh, if we can make changes, we will. Um, and anything specific about, you know, errors in the exercise or things that weren't clear, um, offer us those points of feedback also. We really enjoy your feedback. We really take it to heart. We offer the support a lot, but there's a lot of material and a lot of opportunities for us to improve. So anything that you can provide, we really appreciate it. So we will be back at.
8 a.m. sharp tomorrow morning, starting off with an exercise to get your coffee and have your brains ready to work. Don't forget about your e-learning in preparation for day two and four. And it is required for full course credit. Thank you.